Hi, I am Jerome from Fastlane. Welcome to this series on the Cisco Unify wireless networking solution. Today I would like to talk to you about wireless QoS. In this first video we'll be looking at how wireless QoS works. In the next video we'll be looking at how you configure wireless QoS on the controller. In another video we'll be looking at the delicate problem of wireless QoS applied to between the access point and the controller. And in the last video we'll be expanding wireless QoS to the wire network. So as you know, QoS is the ability to prioritize some frames. This is something you find typically in the voice of a wireless LAN deployment where you want to prioritize the voice packets. If you delay those voice packets, you may hear a choppy conversation. Whereas if you're competing with, say, web packets, you can delay these web packets for a few seconds. The page will be just slower to load, but that's not a big issue. But how do you prioritize packets in the wireless world? Well, the bad news is that there is nothing in the A211 protocol that allows you to do so. As you know, every station has the right to send any time. It's called DCF, Distributed Coordination Function. Who is coordinating? Who has the right to send? Well, nobody. It's distributed. The access point is just passively receiving, so has no control over who is sending first. And every station that has something to send just picks up a number, counts down from this number down to zero, and when it gets down to zero, just sends the packet out. This is how it works. Every station has a driver. This driver defines two values, CWMIN and CWMAX. So every station that has something to send picks up a number that has to be more than CWMIN, then counts down from this number. Once the station reaches down to zero, the station sends the packet. If the station fails sending the packet because of a collision or uh, not getting the acknowledgement, the station doubles the uh, t timer it picked until it reaches CW max, and the station can never pick up a number which is more than CW max. The logic behind this mechanism is that if you fail uh, sending the packet the first time, it's probably because you collided. So instead of retrying exactly the same way, and colliding exactly the same way for the same reason because probably too many people are sending at the same time, uh, the idea of doubling the number you wait or you start from allows to slowly slow down uh, the transmission rate in the cell and of course decrease the risk of collision. So you pick up this number and you count down from there. Every time you count down one number less, you listen to the air. If you hear another station sending something because they reach the zero time, um, then you will hear in this header of this frame that you hear a uh, duration value, which is how long the frame is going to last, how long the medium is going to be occupied for. This is called the network allocation vector. So you hear this number and you basically stop listening or stop counting for the duration of this nav, because you know that during this time someone else is sending. So you wait for that nav and then you resume your countdown from where you left. And every time another one, another station is sending, you produce the same mechanism. You wait for the direction of the, of the frame, which is a network location vector, and then you resume your countdown. Which means that at the end, the total amount of time you'll be waiting before you send your frame will be this back off timer you picked up at the beginning, plus all the network allocation vectors that you heard from other stations sending while you were counting down. This all amount of time is what we call the contention window. So at the end you reach zero and you send. But there is no guarantee that you'll be sending before anybody else. So this is how it works. Several stations, A, B, C, D and E for example, have to send something. They wait for this contention window and then station A is the first to send. Right in the middle of when station A is sending, B is about to get to zero. But B is waiting because of this network location timer it has to wait for. Then it gets to zero and it sends after A. But it doesn't send immediately after A. It waits for a small amount of time after uh, A's frame has been sent, which is called the DIFS for distributed interframe space. And this silence between frames is here so that if there is any reflection or any interference, they could dissipate before someone else sends. B resumes its countdown after A's frame and a DIFS and counts down to zero. Then B gets to zero and sends its frame. After B's frame, another DIFS passes on and then station C's turn comes and then station D and E. But there is no guarantee on who is going to send its packet first. If 
B wants to send voice packets, there is no guarantee that B is going to send before A. They are just picking up a random number. And this number may be higher for B than it is for A, regardless of what kind of traffic is being sent. It's to resolve these kind of problems that in 2005, the IEEE designed the 802.11e protocol. This 802.11e protocol defines two mechanisms. The first one is a tagging equivalency. So they take the QoS values from the wired networks and create equivalent tags or equivalent prioritization systems for the wireless space. That's the first system. And the second system is based on these priority levels. It creates a separate way of treating packets of different categories. This is how it is. On the left, you see the DCF value. You are a station, laptop or phone. You want to send something, you pick up a number. You count down to zero, and then you send your packet. With the 802.11e, if your station is 802.11e enabled, and this enablement is certified by the Wi-Fi Alliance under the wireless multimedia uh, certification, so if your station is WM, it applies parts of the 11e protocol. So if your station is WMM, instead of having one single queue for all packets, each application will have the possibility to label or flag its packet to match it against one of four categories. Each category will pick up a different back of timer. And what is smart is that if your priority is higher, the range in which you'll pick up your random number will be smaller than if your packet has a lower priority. So for example, TC6, you may pick up a slot number, a back of timer, that may be any number between, say, 4 and 7. Whereas TC1, if you have a packet that matches this category, you'll pick up any number between, say, 4 and 31. So because the range is higher for the lower priority, the chances of you waiting longer are higher too. And you will have, within the station, four concurrent queues. So if you have four packets to send, one of each category, you'll pick up a random number for each of those packets and you will count down in parallel. So you have four counts down going on. Just like normal DCF, if in between you hear a station and other stations sending, you stop for the duration of the NAV, network allocation vector, and then you resume from where you left. But basically all four queues will be counting down together. And because the higher priority queues will statistically pick up a lower number, they will get down to zero earlier, most of the time. And then, of course, you will send your packets. Does that work? Oh yes, that works very well. To show you an example, this is an application of that. You have these four queues, and the graphs you see on the, left, on the right side shows you the average uh, duration of the back of timer for each queue. And as you can see, the higher the priority, the less you wait. So this really works very well. Okay, so this is the principle. Then, of course, at the end, you'll be sending your frame. So if you have different packets of different types to send, your voice packets will probably get down to zero first. But then once you get to zero, if voice and data get to zero within a station or between stations, what guarantees that voice will be sent first? Well, there is another mechanism, which is that between frames, instead of waiting a DIFS, if your station is WMM, you'll be waiting something which is called AIFS, which stands for Arbitration into Frame Space. And the idea is that there is an AIFS for each queue. So if you are sending a voice packet, your AIFS is a little bit smaller than if you want to send a data packet. The result is that even if two stations or two queues within one station get down to zero at the same time. Because the AIFS for voice queue is smaller or shorter than the AIFS for the data queue, well, the voice packet will start being sent first before the AIFS expires for the data queue. And the result is that the data packet will not be sent immediately because you'll hear a packet being sent. So you'll, you, you'll wait for the end of this packet. This is how it works. As you can see here, and as a side note, AIFS is always larger than DIFS. And the reason is because this prioritization system within stations, with this countdown that is specific for each queue, makes the WMM packets so more efficient uh, than the normal DCF mechanism that if AIFS was the same as DIFS, DIFS or DCF stations would just have no chance of sending packets in. in 
So this is how it works. In the next video, we're going to look at how you configure it and how you see it in the wireless space animal controller.